Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Wednesday Morning Devo and Encouragement. I'm Matt Siri. Um, I don't know why I didn't say that. <laughs> but I uh, hope you guys are having a wonderful Wednesday morning. It's a beautiful day today. We've had some good weather. A little bit rainy yesterday, but man, we've had some good weather. Very blessed. I hope you guys are all doing very well this Wednesday morning. Um, students here at CCF, we have prayer service tonight. Um, I will send out a uh, reminder to everybody in a bit and ask if anybody can help with um, worship music or with the slides and stuff for tonight and if you guys could be there at all to um, pray with us and just pray as a church um, for our community, for our church and with our pastor pastor search and everything we got going on. Um, we never have enough prayer, right? Never have enough. So, um, hope you guys are doing well. Welcome Wednesday morning, Devo and Encouragement. I know I was um, said I was going to have a um, episode on Friday for part two of the spiritual gifts here in First Corinthians that we're going through this little section of First Corinthians um, 12 through 14, maybe 15 as well. Um, but going through this section here, um, but I was busy, didn't get to it on Friday, so sorry. But here we are, First Corinthians 13, chapter 12. Um, we'll definitely finish up um, the rest of these um, spiritual gifts here, the diversity of them here, and then maybe get into a little bit of... Um, as he goes into uh, 12, 12 to the end of the chapter of unity yet diversity in the body of Christ in the church. So let's read through at least the, the latter part here of um, the first part of chapter 12. Um, so I'm just talking about uh, the manifestation of the Spirit in verse 7. Manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit, to another a message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another, the performance of mir performance of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, distinguishing between spirits, to another, um, different kinds of tongues, to another, interpretation of tongues. One and the same Spirit, it is active in all these, distributing to each person as he wills. Awesome. So... We left off, we had went through um, the first two gifts that, that um, Paul mentions here as spiritual gifts from the Spirit, right? And so, <clears throat> he says the manifestation of the Spirit. Um, we, should, we should never think that the Holy Spirit is more present. Remember, um, I think we said this before, but we, we want to make sure, um, because this, this is the key thing um, when we're talking about... Um, the charismatic movement um, or the charismatic churches um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> just the majority um, or the distinguishment is that like um, what we see mostly for Christianity on TV, Christianity on radio, um, Christianity even in movies, the majority of the time is the charismatic movement or word of faith-ish movement for Portraying the the Christian religion, the Christ, Christianity, in the world today on TV, movies, and um, um, is portraying Christ, charismatic Christianity, right? And so the big thing that we want to distinguish or make sure that we get right is that is this biblical? Is this biblical? And I think the biggest thing that comes from these, if if you're not a sincere, like we talked about being a cessationist, cessationism or continuationism, is asking, do these were these gifts for the time of the apostles alone that was gifted by God to um, authorize their ministry um, while the Bible was still being written, and that the Bible is now closed, the canon of the Holy Scriptures of God is closed, that these apostles that was appointed by God with spiritual giftings is over that has ceased with them cessationism the, the spiritual gifts with them has ceased um giftings right not not to say not to say that god cannot work through people not to say that god still does not do miracles through people when he desires and when he wills not to say that god still doesn't um, give gifts of of wisdom, of faith, of knowledge, of performing miracles, of um, <clears throat> distinguishing spirits, of prophecy. Um, these these other ones, not to say that God won't choose to 
do these at any time that he wills, and he can do it through people, he can do it through whatever means that he wants to, and that he will do it, but that it's not a gift that is to authorize somebody's ministry because there are no more apostles. They don't, their ministry doesn't need to be authorized because the canon of the Bible, the canon of the Holy Scriptures of God, the Word of God, is closed. And so their ministry... Um, because starting the church, starting the church, following after Jesus Christ, it does not need to be authorized anymore. We have it here on the authority of the Word of God, right? So that is cessationism. Continuationism. Um, I went over these a little bit, but I want to make sure to go over them again for this episode. Continuationism about the spiritual gifts is talking about that, um, or tries to say or does say, that we don't have any clear evidence um, that um, the time of the apostles has ended, um, that um, the Bible doesn't say that these have ended. It says that they will end. Like as we get to 1 Corinthians 13, it says that tongues shall cease. It doesn't say that they have, but this is when the Bible was written, right? When 1 Corinthians, when Paul wrote this. Um, under the under the influence carried by by the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Word of God. Um, so we don't. <laughs> continuationism says that they have continued that we don't know um, when 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 do we know that the apostles have ceased, and so these spiritual gifts would still be given out um, each to one person, one to each person, right? Um, so that's that's the way continuationists think about it um, now. For my part, just before we get into this, my part, I would um, think uh, John MacArthur describes himself um, or titles himself as a leaky cessationist, <laughs> and I think that is tr- I think that um, I, I like I like that term or not really like the term, but <laughs> I think it's true that um, um, and as as we will go through this um, for, for, from twelve to thirteen to fourteen, as we see that God's word, His manifestation of His word, if 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 we doubt the authority of God's word, then I think anybody who doubts the authority of God's word, who doubts the authority of it and the completeness of it, um, will then maybe be a continuationist. I don't want to say that about every. Buddy, but um, and not like the thing with the leaky cessationist is like, like I was talking about is that we see these spiritual gifts that God gives to His people, and He gave to these apostles here um, in the time of the apostles to proclaim God's word, to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, and to build up the church of Christ, to build up the church of God as they went forth into this ministry. And yet, as we look to the end of Acts, we start to see these gifts um, die out. We start to see these gifts die out. And that it was they were needed for the completion of the work that God had for his church to build it, to um, authoritate it um, under the word of God, and that the word of God is now closed, that we don't need every single person in the body. We don't need every single um we don't have apostles today, so we don't have anybody that has the authority of this gift to do it whenever they please, right? And the majority of times that we see in the charismatic movement is people, I hate to say people with bad theology, but um, we, we would think, right, that, that um, that's a question I think usually John MacArthur says, is that wouldn't you think that if God gave this gift specifically to somebody, there would be somebody... Uh, a giant in, in in the Christian world who has great theology, who um, does great work solely for the building up of God's kingdom and not for any material, not for any personal gain. Wouldn't you think that? Um, so I'm just stating these things. I'm mainly from um, John MacArthur that says these. I mean, he's he's, ri- he's written a lot of different books um, like um, Strange Fire or... Um, I think a, a couple of different charismatic books back when cause he's been he's been pastoring for like fifty years now. So um, yeah, um, lost my train of thought. But yeah, so just that these gifts 
they they have ceased is is my belief in reading this and we'll go through this and make sure, and try and show you guys where this is at as well but we'll go through this and my belief is that these gifts have ceased in God giving them directly from person to person as we have no apostles today to authoritate our ministry because we have the authority of God that has been shown in all the scripture and in history to be true we point them to the scripture. We point them to the word of God. We don't have to point them to a, I can do this miracle because I have enough faith. And that's the biggest thing in these charismatic churches, is as we see online or on TV, or is that um, it gives off this impression that if you are not, if you do not have enough faith, then you will not get a gift of um, tongues. You will not get a gift of wisdom. You'll, and the biggest, the biggest ones that they do is tongues and miracles, right? And they don't care about distinguishing between spirits, right? Um, or interpreting, interpretation of tongues. And so in these spiritual gifts, we want to make sure that if you are in a charismatic church, um, that it's not being proclaimed or preached that you need to have enough faith and that every single person is going to have a gift of tongues, um, that it's not a gift that is given to every single person if it does continue today. Uh, but you need to have distinguish, distinguishing. You have discernment to know that you are not a good. You don't have. You are not a good Christian because um, you speak in tongues one time. You are not a good Christian because you um, interpret tongues or because you have prophecy or because you <clears throat> are able to perform a miracle. You are not a good Christian because of that. You are a good Christian because of Jesus Christ. A good Christian because of Jesus Christ, because of the blood of the Lamb that was spilt out for us. So that is the main purpose. It's not to continually see these gifts poured out for our own upbringing or anything like that. If we see these gifts, all right? If God sees it, um, chooses to bless somebody with these gifts at the right time, that's not something that's going to happen. You should not expect it. That's the difference. It's not expecting, but that God will work through whatever means he deems necessary in his timing. All right. <clears throat> so um, we went through the first two gifts. Um, the first one as a message of wisdom. To one is given a message of wisdom through the Spirit. The Spirit, capital S, right? It's a big thing to remember <clears throat> is that these manifestations of the Spirit, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is more present in this person than it is in a person who does not have a gift or doesn't show a gift, right? Um, and we're talking about this time. Let me, let me talk about this time here first, all right? This time here where these gifts were given, all right? The Holy Spirit is always present with believers. But at times, he is more apparent through the manifestation of the Spirit. It's what we see here for sure. And we, we may see that in the world today. We will not always see, but we may, right? More apparent, but not more present in that person, right? He's always with us. So given to each one for the, this is the big thing, given to each person, each one for the profit of all, for the common good, all right? So this first one, manifestation <clears throat> is given a message of wisdom, a word of wisdom. This is the unique ability to speak forth the wisdom of God, especially in an important situation, important situations as shown in Stephen in Acts 7 and Paul in Acts 23, these big times where the people need the word of wisdom from God. I believe that, yes, that, that some of these things um, could, could still be um, given to God's people today, to God's um, preachers and theologians, um, that God definitely does call them to a ministry, call them to this ministry, and then he gifts them, he equips them. He equips people with different um, words of wisdom like this to be able to speak forth the wisdom of God at different times. And I think about our time in our country right now um, where like John MacArthur um, really speaking out at the time when the church needs to be open and does not need to be shut down by the government, right? Um, people over there, um, churches over there in Canada are doing the same thing with even more people. The church is getting fined and pastors getting thrown into jail for having their churches open when they're on lockdown. And it's it's words of wisdom, words of wisdom shown forth that they speak the word of God, not their own portrayal, not their own um, wrongful 
um, interpretation or wrongful eisegesis, what we talked about last week, um, putting their own interpretation or bringing their own bias to the text before they even read it and then interpret it correctly, seeing what the original meaning was, the original intent, authorial intent, um, context, everything. And so word of wisdom given to some people. The other one, the second one, is word of knowledge. The unique ability to declare knowledge that could only be revealed supernaturally, as shown in Jesus, right? <clears throat> and we see this. Um, it doesn't have to be in special people. That, and so if, if we believe this is a cessationist view, that God still does use this in his people today, and that he does it through his will, that he gives these gifts through his will, that it will, might not be with somebody for their whole life, but that God does this through the manifestation of his spirit um, to be more apparent in some people at different times, or maybe some people have this gift that God has given them for sure for their whole life, right? And so he says um, uh, here that uh, as shown in supernaturally, revealed supernaturally, word of knowledge, right? And so we see this as Jesus, of course, because Jesus is 100% God, 100% man, right? God the Son, incarnate on earth. We see this, that Jesus had the knowledge of God as a man, right? Um, <clears throat> I think I talked about this before, was that when Charles Spurgeon was saved, it was at the preaching of a man, a lowly, just small country town house preacher, who directed a portion of a sermon right at young Charles Spurgeon, who was supernaturally spoke to right to where his heart was in the exact moment. And then he was led on to go and be called the Prince of Preachers and speak that we still listen to his sermons and read his sermons um, and everything today that he was a gifted preacher, very gifted um, in the knowledge of God and the wisdom of God's word, right? And so these things are two different things, wisdom and knowledge, <clears throat> two different things, right? Most We must always use discernment, <clears throat> excuse me, when hearing, receiving a word of knowledge, remembering that God is not the only source of supernatural knowledge, right? So God is not the only source of supernatural knowledge, right? So if, if somebody is speaking supernatural knowledge that is above and beyond the Bible that we have today as the Word of God, if it's above and beyond something that is not in Scripture, we need to make sure that we verify it with the Word of God. If it goes against the Word of God, then it is not from God. Because we know that God will not lie, God's Word does not return void, and that no word, no tittle out of the word of God will ever cease, will ever um, go away. That's what Jesus said. No tittle of the word of God, no script <clears throat> will ever pass away from God's word. It'd be easier for heaven and earth to pass away, right? So we know <clears throat> that it, we need to have discernment. Spiritual discernment is what God calls us to as his disciples, as his people. To discern, is this word of knowledge from God, actually? Is it that God is the source or is it another supernatural source? Because we definitely can have our own demons. We can have demons. We can have Satan himself that speaks to knowledge to some people, right? And so anybody, anybody, if you're listening to any message, any word from any single preacher, even if it's you know somebody who's been a thorough, um, solid theological preacher, for his whole life, you know, like I've been using John MacArthur a lot because he's been preaching, you know, 50 years. Um, <clears throat> sound, theological, and, you know, has his own, uh, the Master's University there um, and seminary. And so um, even somebody like him, right, we need to make sure that you do not put that preacher um, on a pedestal because, oh, he does have a word of faith. He, he He's, um, some people would say, apostle. He's not, okay, but he is a word of he is a sound preacher, a sound pastor that has been gifted by God with words of knowledge to proclaim, word of wisdom would be more precise, that to proclaim the wisdom of God, to proclaim the word of God in all its truthfulness, in all its truthfulness from its source, the word of God, right? To proclaim that boldly, 
boldly. And so the thing that we need to do as Christians, no matter who we are listening to, is we need to discern the word of God in what they are saying. Are they taking this scripture out of context? Are they preaching a sermon that is more um, topical rather than expository? Topical preaching is good too. Um, like like if we're going through um, with Johnny, like what, what is the gospel? That's great because we're going to have to go through different passages. It's great. We need that too. Um, we need that as well. But, we, but if, if somebody's going, uh, we're doing a sermon on, uh, let's see, we're doing a sermon on, uh, we're doing we're, we're gonna do a sermon on depression, right? How to fight depression. Um, are three tips of how to fight depression, um, and then he's gonna go to you know three different verses: one from the Old Testament, two from the New Testament, right? And he's got a message on how to three different ways of how to fight depression, things like that, <clears throat> where it's a topical, um, and it's about us. It does not give any glory. To God, it does not proclaim the gospel, the life, death, resurrection of Jesus Christ, um, the uh, fallen nature of man, and why we um, are under the wrath of a holy God. It does not proclaim any of that. So we need to make sure that if, if we're listening to a pa if our pastor, we're in church who only does topical preaching and is very man-centered, then. It might be a church that you need to leave or just have discernment in it. Is this guy actually speaking to what the Word of God says? Or is he just saying that he knows more and then he's giving you three ways of how to be a better life, how to have a happier life outside of Christ, right? Even if it is have a happy life um, always about us, always about us, man-centered, that is not why we go to church. Why we go to church is to worship God through every single point of this, to worship God, to know him more, to worship God, right, with all the believers. That's why our worship, our musical worship shouldn't be man-centered. Our prayer should not be man-centered. Our um, word, the giving of the word, the message, sermon should not be man-centered. Every single part of the service should not be man-centered. It should be Christ-centric, glorifying God, not uh, horizontal completely, but vertical, and that we do that by encouraging each other horizontally to worship God vertically, all right? So I got off on that tangent there, but that is so true. The spiritual discernment is a big thing that Christians need, and the Church of God, Church of Christ here in the world today needs a ton more of that. Spiritual discernment, I speak for myself as well, we need spiritual discernment, and how do we, how do we get more of that? How do we get more of that spiritual discernment? of a big thing is what God has told us is that to know him more we need to be in his word he has spoken to us it is closed it is true it is full and complete the word of God is has spoken as Ada Batozer said it says the, the Bible is a word that has spoken and it is a word that now continues to speak right speaks even now it speaks to us God speaks to us through his word so if you want to hear God speak loudly, read the Bible out loud, right? That's what it will. It will do. God speaks to us through his word. So even if we see a word is true, it does not mean that it is from God. Even if we say, like like somebody who's who's doing that, you know, the three ways to fight depression that say, oh, um, exercise more, right? If, if, if a pastor says that, exercise more, right? Sure, that's that's true. Is that from God? Is that from God? Do we ever see that in the Word of God? We see it does talk about you know disciplining ourselves, discipline ourselves. Paul talks about physical training is of some value, but uh, spiritual training, spiritual godliness is of eternal value, right? So we think we need to see things like that. That any time a pastor, any time we are thinking that somebody is telling us a word of knowledge, this gift here, we need to have spiritual discernment to know is it from God. Is it from God or another source of supernatural knowledge? Even if that word is true, it does not mean that it's directly from God, right? And that the one speaking the word is truly representing God, right? Some people can twist scripture and twist scripture to make it sound so true and so good to us, right? We can twist scripture and say that... Um, that uh, God loves us even if we don't repent, even if we don't repent and turn to him, 
that you'll that you, everyone will go to heaven, right? Even if you don't repent and turn to Jesus Christ, everybody will go to heaven. No, that's not what Scripture says, right? Scripture tells us that those who repent and follow Christ, turn from our sins, turn unto Christ, by the gift of God's grace, we have eternal life with Christ, that he has now atoned for us, the blood of Christ atoned for you, and has blessed us with justification by the blood of Jesus Christ. So, spiritual discernment, big point there, spiritual discernment to know are these gifts actually from God, right? Are these gifts actually from God, or is it somebody um, twisting, or is it somebody um, with another supernatural, like a demon, Anything like that, those are true, right? Those are true. Sometimes th Christians, I think, get too into it that they would say, oh, God is God has you know, defeated the devil. Yes, he has, but he still reigns over this earth. He does. He doesn't reign over this earth, okay? He has, um, he has power over it, all right? He has power over us. He does. But God reigns. The Lord reigns over this earth. The devil has power. He does. He's on a leash by God, right? So the gift of faith. Though the gift of faith is this next one. Um, let's see. Wisdom of uh, wisdom through the Spirit to another message of knowledge by the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit. So faith by the same Spirit. Faith is an essential part of the Christian life, right? It's essential because we are saved by grace through faith. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, right? And we know that by the word of God alone, by scripture alone, right? So the gift of faith, through, though faith is an essential part of every Christian's life, the gift of faith is the unique ability to trust God against all circumstances. That's what my commentary says. As Peter did when he walked out of the boat onto the water. Another mighty example of the gift of faith in the scripture was the Christian leader, in, or uh, in uh, Puritan life, um, was a Christian leader and philanthropist, George Mueller, who in 19th century England provided for thousands of orphans completely by prayer without ever asking for donations. That's amazing. I, I just listened to one of George Mueller's sermons, um, his, his most popular sermon probably. Um, I think it was called Gift of Faith or uh, Faith in Christ or something like that. Um, just listen to that. Just this is just this week, just on Monday, I think. So George Mueller, yeah, awesome example, the gift of faith, Christian leader, philanthropist, um, George Mueller in the 19th century, England, he provided for thousands of orphans completely by prayer without ever asking for donations. This is amazing, just his, his gift of faith that he had to trust God in every circumstance, that he did not get paid for his preaching or for his things that he did. But he provided for thousands of orphans. He wanted to make sure that the church was doing this, that um, these orphans weren't going astray. Like this, this is the time of, um, you know, Oliver Twist, right? Oliver Twist. Just going to have some more. And completely by prayer, he was able to provide. Completely by prayer. Completely by the power of God as he did this through faith, Right? So that is amazing that God has gifted him with faith and so many people that God gifts with this amazing faith to trust God in every single circumstance. And so we see here, right, that at least from what we get in this passage, that this gift of faith is a gift, right? You cannot work up to this. We cannot... Er, it doesn't say that it that it that it will come to every single believer. That oh, if 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 you if you read enough Bible, if you if you read enough of the Word of God, if you uh, memorize enough Scripture, if you pray enough, you'll have enough faith. It's not. It's these these things, right? We're talking about these gifts, spiritual gifts, are not things today that we expect, but is a gift of God's grace that God gives out to his people when he deems right, when he wills it. But this gift of faith, 
is amazing to see and gives us amazing testament the amazing testament to the grace of God, the amazing testament to the goodness of God, to proclaim that God's word is true, to proclaim the glory of God, not to proclaim our own glory, right? Not for our own, but for the goodness of God, to proclaim his glory and for the common good, for the good of all. The next one, big one, right? Gift of healings. Gift of healings. By the one spirit, right? It always keeps saying by this one spirit because we we can we can see that even in, in Christ's time, right? Um, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the people uh, when the disciples were like, uh, was the disciples or the people the people in this town? Um, I can't remember if it was disciples. I'm sorry for butchering this if, if I am. But when these people were casting out demons. Um, yeah, we're casting out demons um, in the name of Christ, but yet they did not know Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, you did not know, but you were able to. And the, um, the disciples were like, how, how were they able to when um, they, they did not know you? They did not believe in you. And it says that there is other spirits, other supernatural spiriting um, or sources that can give these, Right. And so we see that. We see that. And I think Christians, too many in, in the world today, too much think that every single supernatural thing is from God, is from the gift of God. We see that some things can come from other supernatural sources, such as demons or such as Satan himself, right? We, we see that. We can see that in the world today, right? Satan and his demons are not in hell yet are not um, in hell in the lake of fire, right? When Jesus returns, he will throw him and the demons into the lake of fire, right? And so that's, it's, sometimes I think Christians forget that, for sure, myself included. So gifts of healing, this gift of healing, this is God's healing power, either given or received, and has been repeatedly documented in the New Testament and since, right? We, we, we do see a lot of healings in the world today. Supernatural healings. A lot of them come right. If 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 we if we see a lot right, come from, um, like say doctors or, or or different things that has that has been gifted. People have been gifted with this, and it's not. We keep we keep saying this. It's it's tough because we think that it's it's a lifelong thing that that, that they do this of their own volition. That um, somebody, the doctor, you know, um, like that movie Breakthrough, um, that a doctor was able to heal this kid. Um, who had been in the ice for, you know, 40 minutes or an hour almost. Um, he was able to help him um, because of his great knowledge. Um, no, he, and there's something, you know, things that are unexplainable naturally, but that the supernatural power of God has healed this person or healed this person or that person in his power, in his um, proclamation, in his will. And so we see that many times in the world today. We see that a ton of times in the New Testament by the people of God to proclaim the goodness of God, to proclaim the authority of Scripture, to proclaim the authority of the Church of God. Right? Um, and so we see that a lot, um, either given or received. And so the big thing that we need to remember is that it's not, like even, even, even this doctor, right? He might not be a Christian. It might not even turn him into a Christian. Right, but it is gifted there for a purpose. God gifts it for a purpose at the time. Even the person who, if if he did the healing, right, was not a Christian, but he was empowered by God, used by God for His purpose to do a great thing, to do a good thing that will give God glory, and He will get glory out of it. He will, He will. Adam Clark on gifts of healing, he says the power which, at particular times, the apostles received from the Holy Spirit to cure diseases, right, as in Peter or Paul, a power which was not always resident in them, right? For Paul, he could not cure Timothy, right? Nor could he remove his own thorn in his own flesh, because it was given only on extraordinary occasions, though perhaps more generally than many others. So that's the thing, right? We cannot pinpoint and I think that's the that's the big thing with um, charismatic churches today or word of faith churches is that uh, they think that we have a pinpoint 
um, or at least the preaching seems to be that, that, that we have a pinpoint on the Spirit of God that we can command the Spirit of God to do this. And that he says, and that they, they say that we have this command of the Spirit of God that we can proclaim him to do these things. That every time we say, Spirit of God, heal this person in Jesus' name that he has to move and heal this person. He does not. He does not. We see that nowhere in Scripture, that he does have to, that he um, bends to our commands, that he obeys our commands. No, he does not obey our commands. God is God, all right? And so even in this time here, I love this, because even, <clears throat> even in this time of the apostles, where they were gifted more generally, more times, right? They, they had this more expectantly, more generally, but still not all the time, right? He said he could not cure Timothy, right? Paul could not cure Timothy. In these times where they could not cure somebody, where they could not heal somebody, it did not mean that they didn't have the gift then all of a sudden, right? God still had given it to them, but he didn't, he didn't choose to use it in that time. He didn't, he didn't say, I'm, he didn't say, I'm not healing because you don't have the gift anymore. You don't trust me enough anymore. You don't have enough faith anymore. No. He said, I'm not healing in this time because it is for my good purpose so that I will get the glory in whatever God's plan was for that time. And so that's the big thing. So we need to have discernment to know that we do not get, if, if we do have any of these gifts today, it is not a pinpoint that we say, boom, Spirit of God, go heal this person, and then he has to do that. He is commanded and beckoned by our will and by our prayer to do this automatically. It's not. We do get that nowhere in Scripture. And so from this, we see that Paul, he could not cure Timothy when he prayed, nor could he remove his own thorn in the flesh, right? Paul himself, the great preacher, the great, um, you know, Amazing, all these letters that he wrote to all these churches, church starter, the great power, empowered by God, so powerful by God, right? To speak the word of God, to write it, to proclaim it, and start all these churches, right? To many a different people. And he had the power to cure diseases, the power to heal, right? He had that power given to him by God for his purposes in extraordinary ways, extraordinary occasions, but it was not always. It was more generally than others, yes, because he was an apostle gifted or um, granted his authority as an apostle by Jesus Christ, right, when he converted him. Um, but he could, he still could not heal Timothy, right? He could not cure Timothy, and he had his own, his own thorn in the flesh that God would not remove for whatever reason that God said it was. Um, and... <laughs> You know, we, we, we think about that, right? <laughs> and we're like, oh, these people, uh, um, people that talk about that, oh, God does, yes, God does want us to be healthy. God wants us to be, um, um, uh, or God does bless us. God does bless us. And that we are, but it's, it's, it's the source. It's the source of this health. It's the source of this um, a blessing that we proclaim the glory of God, not that we say, oh, I'm, I'm good now because I was able to have enough faith and say, um, sickness here, be gone, right? Cancer, be gone. And so that, that's the thing that like, um, I think of like, uh, Matt Chandler, um, or I think John Parker as well, and pe pre you know, pre preachers, pastors who have had, um, dealings with cancer or different things. And yeah, they're, we, they pray, and we have many people praying for them, like Bodhi Bakum even now today too. But the ones who have good theology, who know the Word of God, and who are truly saved, know that it's not a gift of healing that somebody's going to come in and heal them um, expectedly, but that God can do whatever He wills and whatever He wills for His, for His glory, and it'll be for our good, where He'll get the most glory. And it'll still be for our good, no matter what it is, right? So think about that. The gifts of healing, most of these apostles had this, and they had it greatly. But it was not all the time, as well as not expected, that they couldn't um, always say, heal this person, Spirit of God, and he would automatically be healed. But that God did it if it was in accordance with his word, in accordance with his will. Working of miracles is the next one, right? 
So the first one is healing, right? Healing is one. And then miracles, the form of some miracles. Literally, dynamace, dynamace, right? Dynamice. Dynamite is where we get our word dynamite, right? It's an act of power. This describes when the Holy Spirit chooses to override the laws of nature as a pilot might use manual controls working in or through an available person, right? So this is closely related to healing, but this is more so on a miraculous, supernatural level, right? Override the laws of nature working in and through an available person. So many people... Gifts of miracles, right? So we're in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Gifts of healing and working of miracles often operate in conjunction with the gift of faith, right? Often. In Acts 3, 1 through 8, these things are not done on the whim of the individual, as if the power to heal or work miracles was at their permanent disposal. Big thing, big key we're always looking at, right? Right? Instead, they operate as an individual is prompted by God and given the faith to perform such a work. Another example of this is in Acts 14, 8 through 10. Let me, let me read that for you real quick. All right. Acts 14, 8 through 10. Uh, let's see here. Acts 14, 8 through 10. It says, In Lystra, a man was sitting um, whose feet were incom incapacitated. He had been disabled from his mother's womb, right? Couldn't walk from his mother's womb. Never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke. Paul looked at him intently and saw that he had faith to be made well. He saw that he had faith to be made well. And what did he say? He said with a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And the man leaped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice saying in the loud uh Lacanian language, the gods have become like men and have come down to us, right? Then these people tried to praise Paul. Um, yeah, they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes, right? <clears throat> so they tried to praise Paul and Barnabas for what they had been doing here, right? And so that is, and then they, they made sure to tell him no, 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 this is not of our doing. This is not us. We are not gifted just because we are some sort of good person, some sort of um, person that has enough faith. No, this gift of faith is a gifting of God. This gift of healing, this gift of, of miracles is a gift of God. It is nothing by which their glory was to get. All right? So that's gifts of miracles, right? Gifts of miracles to this people. Like Paul, the apostles who need, who had these to authoritate their ministry, right? <clears throat> Prophecy is another one here. <clears throat> the foretelling, telling forth of God's message, a particular situation, right? Always in accord with his word. If it's outside of his word, it is not true. It is not true. It is not. If it goes against God's word, it is not a prophecy of God. Get that right. If it goes against God's word, it's not a prophecy of God. And his current work, always in accord with God's word and his current work. Sometimes this has the character of foretelling the future, as in Acts 21 or Acts 27. Oftentimes, people who believe the miraculous gifts um, have been removed from the church, as in cessationism, right, wish to define prophecy as preaching. Though this is common, um, it is inaccurate. There is a Greek word for preaching and a Greek word for divinely inspired speech. Paul uses the word for divinely inspired speech, not preaching here. All right, so that's a big key to make. This Greek word is for divinely inspired speech, not the same word he used for preaching. Other places. Although good, spirit-anointed preaching will often use the spontaneous gift of prophecy, right? It is inaccurate to divine prophecy as good preaching that's that's a good thing i like i like that um i think that's true that the, that the word here tells us um that this word is for divine um what's it called? divine inspired speech right and so um not all preachers are prophets um and, and we say that if, if if we think if we believe that these gifts have um, ceased that we don't have any prophets today so we just have um 
preachers that are gifted with the word of knowledge or the word of wisdom from God to proclaim these scriptures, to proclaim the good news, the gospel, to proclaim Christ, to proclaim the authority of scripture, because scripture is true. All of God's word is true and will not return void, right? So that is prophecy. Prophecy. And so a big thing, I think, I forget who says it, but uh, it might have been Augustine or somebody, that in today, because Bible, because the Holy Scriptures are complete and authoritative, that any prophecy or divine, or, you know, any prophecy, any thing that we think is, is divinely inspired, if, if it is above the Bible, if it is above the Word of God, and yet it's still, you know, it still goes with the Word of God, it still is in accordance with God's Word, then why do we need it? Because we know that we have sufficiency and authority of Scripture. Those are two big things I think we need to take in these whole gifts of the Spirit, especially this one of prophecy, and then uh, if we think of um, word of wisdom or knowledge as well, is that nothing, if, if, if it is above Scripture, if it's extra to Scripture, extra revelation to Scripture, but yet it's it still coordinates with Scripture, then why do we need it? Because we know and we have a firm belief that God's Word is sufficient for all that we need and all that we need to know, right? There is nothing that we go through that is not sufficient to help us in the Word of God. And there is no other extra revelation that is authoritative that God said it over God's Word. Right. Next one is to another uh, prophecy, to another um, distinguishing between spirits, discerning of the spirits. Right. We talked about this a little bit in the last one, um, but as well is that every Christian needs spiritual discernment as we're talking about any of these gifts. Right. Discerning of the spirits, the ability to tell the difference between true and false doctrine. And between what is of the Holy Spirit and what isn't, right? So doctrine is um, a set of beliefs that we, as the church, um, um, label or um, compile that we see from Scripture. Whether it's Scripture as a whole, whether it's a context of Scripture. Um, um, yeah, so if, if you do any type of systematic theology, reading like Wayne Gruden's systematic theology, you'll see a bunch of good doctrine in there. Um, like the doctrine of Christ, um, the doctrine of um, the church, um, the doctrine of uh, soteriology, of, of salvation. Much of these things we need to study, and every Christian should be a theologian. That's that's a big, I think it's a book from R.C. Sproul, but um, it's a big thing that every Christian should be a theologian. Every Christian needs to study the Bible, needs to study and know God more. It's what we are called to do. So, right, we've seen 2 Corinthians 11, um, 14. Um, yeah, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man, oh wait, if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him. Wait a second. Oh, that's 1 Corinthians. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Let's say in 2 Corinthians 11, 14, we see that Satan appears as an angel of light. So having discernment is essential for the believer. Yeah, and no wonder, for Satan distinguishes himself as an angel of light, right? And so having discernment is a necessary, um, a necessary thing for the, for the, for the Christian. And um, we see this as a gift here that Paul labels this in, in 1 Corinthians 12. A gift to another is distinguishing between spirits. And I think of people you know, like Jordan Peterson. Um, Jordan Jordan Peters, wait. Is that his name? Jordan Peters? Not J Jordan Peters? Or yeah, I think that's his name. Not Jordan. Maybe I'm thinking. I'm getting two people mixed up. But um, yeah, um, people who have discernment between the spirits, who know the word, who know um, know the word of God, have been gifted with this knowledge or understanding, maybe to to see which are important which are from God which correlate with the word of God correctly to know that they're from God All right to another we're almost done sorry but this is getting long um, to another different kinds of tongues now this is a big one hopefully I don't spend too much time on this maybe we'll have to add into it next time as well yeah we'll add into it next time 
Um, but I'll just go off on this quickly as we wrap up here. So the gift of tongues, let me read what my commentary says. He says, gift of tongues is a personal language of prayer given by God, whereby the believer can communicate with God beyond the limits of knowledge and understanding. We see that in 1 Corinthians 14 as well, which we'll get to. Um, language is an agreement between parties, right? Where, it's, where it is agreed that certain sounds represent certain objects or ideas. When using the gift of tongues, we agree with God that as the Holy Spirit prays through us, though we may not understand what we are praying, God does. All right? And so we will get into... Once again, to chapter 14, excuse me, sorry. In chapter 14, we'll see um, how God wants us to use tongues in church. All right, so he's talking about this, not, not yet in the whole church aspect. He's talking about this in the community of believers, primarily in the people, in the apostles, the people that God has granted the authority authority by Christ that Christ has authoritated them to be his apostles to proclaim the good news to proclaim the gospel of Jesus to start up his church as we go forth so we have we are now in the church age that we've been in for many many years and the bible right has been our authority complete authority for what um I can I can tell you exactly, but <laughs> hundreds of years, 500, 600 years, I want to say something like that. Um, but yes, so for a long time, right, all these complete manuscripts that we have of New Testament and Old Testament and together the authority of the Bible, we have that, knowing that um, the gift of tongues, right, we're going we're to talk about that in more, more detail on the next one. Um, hopefully I'll, I can either get that Friday or wait, I don't have to wait till next Wednesday. We'll see what time I've got. But spiritual gifts, right? These are great things. And the big thing we want to remember is that here in verse 7, he says, Manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person. Now, each person here at the time was talking to the apostles, was talking to the apostles here at this time, right? The people who God had directly through Jesus proclaimed that they were authoritative for his ministry, for the common good, right? So the big thing we want to make sure that we know is that this is for the time. This is for the right time, for the right purpose and uh, glory of God. That it's not a permanent thing. Like as we saw with um, the gift of healing or the gift of miracles through the apostles, like even Paul, right? That he, he could not heal everybody. He could not heal even his, his uh, ministry partner, Timothy. He could not heal himself, right? But yet he was gifted more supernaturally rather than just one instance. Um, but he was gifted more supernaturally and generally than many other people, right? He was gifted as this by God to do it um, under the authority of the Spirit of God. But yet it was not for every time. It was not permanent. It was not for every single time that he um, wanted to. But when it aligned with the will and power of of God and his desire to proclaim his good news, to proclaim this in the time that he desired it, right? We cannot bend God's will. We cannot, um, we cannot uh, bend God's will. We cannot um, command the spirit of God, right? We cannot. There's nowhere in scripture where we see that. So let us know that it's not permanent but that God does gift his people, and he for sure gifted them in the time of the apostles, right? We know that for sure, and yet God still does work today. He has not stopped working, but yet it might not be as generally or as um, uh, fervently that he gifts people, because we have no apostles today, to do these things um, when, we, when we deem them necessary, right? But God does work. He works so many good things. He works in many ways, many of the times, through his people proclaiming the word of God. The majority of the times that God works, right, especially in salvation, the biggest thing. That's the most important thing. The most important thing is not the healing. It is not a prophecy. It is not a... Uh, I'm thinking the gift of tongues, right? It's those are not the most important thing. 
these are great gifts, yes. And so they distinguish the authority of these apostles in the time. But today, we are not searching for these things. We are searching to know God more. And then what we go out and do with that is to proclaim the gospel unto salvation, how God works us, works in us through that. That is the greatest gift that God has chosen to say, you proclaim my good news. Take the word and proclaim it to people. Proclaim the gospel that we are fallen, that Christ has come and he lived the perfect life and that he died on that cross to take apart all the sins of people who would call upon him. He says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, repents of our sins and follows after Jesus Christ, will be saved. Right? Let's proclaim that good news that Christ rose from the dead to give us eternal life to those who call upon the name of the Lord. Right? Confess his name unto Jesus Christ alone. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. So that's it for today. Until next time, part three. <laughs> Sorry, I was taking so long, rambling on and on, but um, God bless you guys. It's a long episode, <laughs> but take care. God bless and go with Christ. All glory be to Christ. Amen.